Since June of 1997, Dr. Gordon Hugenberger has been senior minister of Park Street Church in Boston, a thriving congregation in the heart of the city where many members of the Gordon community attend. Prior to joining the Park Street Church ministerial staff, he served for 23 years as pastor of the Orthodox Congregational Church of Lanesville in Gloucester. A native of Wellesley, Dr. Hugenberger was the fifth of seven children. As a high school freshman working at a Salvation Army camp, he heard the gospel with clarity for the first time and surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. Dr. Hugenberger received a bachelor's degree from Harvard University, a master's degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and a PhD from Oxford University in England. Many at Gordon will recognize Dr. Hugenberger as a long-serving and faithful trustee of Gordon College who brought strong biblical insights and academic wisdom to board discussions of cultural and academic issues. He also used his wise and very wry humor at the right moments to lighten up debate in the Board of Trustees. Currently, Dr. Hugenberger is a ranked adjunct professor of Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell, where he has taught since 1974. He and his wife, Jane, have four children and reside in Boston. Let's welcome Dr. Gordon Hugenberger. Actually, it was a uh, student from this campus that led me to the Lord in ninth grade. So I, my sense of indebtedness to Gordon College and uh, Gordon Divinity School at that time uh, is something that goes very deep. But uh, let me begin with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, I do pray that uh, you would greatly bless each person in this wonderful sanctuary, that they might miraculously be able to hear a better message than the one that will be coming out of my mouth. We pray, O Holy Spirit, that you would apply your word to our lives. Enable us to live more courageously, more faithfully, and to be more effective in your service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of us who are a bit older will remember a terrible tragedy that took place in the summer of 1983, and it's something of which I often think each time I drive Boston to New York City. It took place on Route 95 uh, as a part of uh, the area in around Greenwich over the Miamis River where in the middle of the night a 100-foot section of a bridge collapsed. It was on the eastbound side, the side of the return trip uh, to the Boston area. The terrifying accounts in the New York Times and the Boston Globe were utterly arresting. They pointed out that much of what caused the problem had to do with the unfortunate weather. It was kind of a rainy uh, period of time. It was late at night. And that section of the bridge involves a slight elevation, a little bit of a rise, so that as you approach it, you're not aware that it is going over a very deep ravine, the river 70 feet below the bridge. And until you're right upon the failed part of the bridge, you don't see it. It so happens, by the grace of God, the collapse took place around 1.30 in the morning, and there was a car in which two individuals, William Anderson and Shannon Kelly, uh, were driving. Uh, they were on their way to Maine to attend a wedding of a mutual friend. And up ahead, they saw two trucks, somewhat in the distance, proceeding along, heading toward the bridge, when all of a sudden the brakes, the, the brake lights went on and they assumed there must be an accident up above uh, that area that they were seeking to avoid. Both trucks then jackknifed and to the horror of Anderson and Kelly, suddenly the trim lights disappeared and it was pitch black. 
The two trucks disappeared. They slammed on their brakes, and they managed to stop 10 feet short of the abyss. At that point, they ran out of their car, ran back uh, along 95 as fast as they could, began waving uh, in, a, in, in anticipation of any approaching vehicle and sh tried to shout them down. Uh, one car, unfortunately, didn't take the warning, continued to go on and went right over uh, the bridge. Another car slowed down, a BMW. Uh, two individuals, two men were inside. They rolled down the, the window, and Anderson and Kelly started shouting, the bridge has collapsed, the bridge has collapsed. And instead of listening, the two uh, individuals were shouting back obscenities and giving uh, an obscene gesture, whereupon they then accelerated and went off into the darkness and ultimately uh, to their death uh, 70 feet below the bridge. It's clear from inter interviews uh, afterward that Anderson and Kelly were both believers. Uh, Anderson was finishing up his doctorate in analytical chemistry at the University of Tennessee. Kelly was preparing to become a pharmacist. And they both said that following the accident, they did a lot of praying. Anderson said to his interviewers of the Globe, I don't feel as lucky so much as blessed. I think everything happens for a reason. Right now, I can't say why me, but I just feel grateful to be alive. Some people died that night. We tried to help them, and we saw them go over. Afterward, we could hear those men hollering for help. They were unable to escape and drowned within their car. You know, we often hear about how actions speak louder than words. Uh, the aphorism of St. Francis of Assisi is frequently quoted, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. And for many of us, we latch on to that and accept from it the kind of permission that maybe we were seeking anyway uh, to button our lips and hope against hope that somehow or other our lives will be just so attractive that people will stop us in the street and say, please tell me about your faith. You clearly believe in something better than I do. It may have worked that way in the 13th century for St. Francis of Assisi, but nowadays it doesn't seem to happen quite so. Uh, most folks don't seem to be as observant or because of their allergy to religion aren't likely to conclude uh, that there's something about which to even inquire. They'll assume that you were just brought up well. That's why you're such a decent bloke. If Anderson and Kelly, of course, had jammed on the brakes, and then stepped aside, perhaps into the uh, breakdown lane, and just waited there until someone stopped and asked them, why, why are you doing this? Uh, we might have been impressed with their humble spirit, their sensitive approach, waiting to be asked. But in fact, a great many more people would have perished that night than, than did. Obviously, we need to practice what we preach. The Apostle Peter couldn't be more clear about it. He begins our text in chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you might inherit a blessing. Peter underscores the moral quality of our lives that is absolutely mandatory and and certainly desirable to, or, to adorn the message, to make it attractive to those that we might want to influence. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi was once asked, uh, what was his opinion of Christianity? And he responded that actually he had some serious difficulties with the claims of Christ, and the problem was that he had met too many of his followers. Uh, Peter was alert to this problem. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Uh, Peter returns to the very same theme in the text that was read for us tonight, uh, that we are to do this uh, with gentleness and respect, giving that reason for the hope that is in us, keeping a clear conscience that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ 
may be ashamed of their slander. So just the way we respond is supposed to be part of the package, uh, the medium up to the uh, standard of the message. Of course, we ought to do this just to obey Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, We ought to do it moreover. We ought to be seeking this uh, life of love uh, that Peter describes in detail, returning uh, good for evil and all the rest of it. We ought to be doing it because, frankly, it's what we're made for. It's the key to the greatest satisfaction in life. Because to this you were called so that you might inherit a blessing, he says in verse 9. You know, sometimes we tend to think almost perversely that God has invented all these rules in order to spoil our fun, uh, maybe to limit our development or something. Uh, But in fact, Peter insists that, no, it's not that at all. And he enjoys quoting Psalm 34, which was also read for us in multiple languages, uh, quoting it to drive home the point. Whoever would love life in see good days. Would you like to love life? Uh, Would you like to see good days? Well, you must keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. And these aren't just, you know, helpful suggestions for successful living. Uh, These things are so because God exists. And he's watching us and blessing us according to these precepts. As Peter goes on in his quotation of Psalm 34, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Uh, Really, this would be a great introduction to a a sermon series on the goodness of being good, Uh, focusing on the reality of what a blessing it is, how we are made for this obedience to which the Lord has called us, the life of love. Uh, You know, I think it's a helpful antidote to the sort of self-pity that many Christians tend to wallow in. Uh, the exaggeration of the opposition that is out there and uh, becomes uh, such an onerous kind of burden to them. The grousing, the belly aching about the hard parts of the Christian life. Of course, there is a cost to discipleship. We have to lose our lives to find them. But in fact, losing your life is the way to find them. And so it brings a blessing. Uh, Yes, we have to take up our cross, but to bear the cross is uh, to guarantee that we will wear the crown. We have to give rather than take, but Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. I admit it is an acquired taste. Uh, You have to practice it a while until it becomes more like second nature, but in the end, it's true, isn't it? Uh, The more you give, the more you receive. It it all boomerangs back on you. Certainly this is the case in marriage as well. Paul doesn't hesitate to make this point that, yes, husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church. He who loves his wife loves himself, says Paul. In other words, husbands, do yourselves a favor. Love your wife. You'll never regret it. The scripture describes this in many, many different ways. Of course, there's the psalm, whoever would love life and see good days. But it's also the psalm, Psalm 119 way of stating it. I run in the paths of your commands for you've set my heart free. That's the moral equivalent of your college motto, you know, freedom within the framework of faith. Uh, it's liberating to do that which, for which you are made, for which I'm made. Nevertheless, uh, you know, Peter recognizes that not always does it work in immediate terms exactly as we had hoped. Uh, It would not surprise Peter if, in fact, you're going to meet up with some opposition. After all, uh, he implies that there is going to be opposition. What else? Why else say don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult but with blessing? Uh, This is not Pollyannish thinking. There's a recognition that Well, for Peter himself, he experienced the opposition as he was dragged before the Sanhedrin. Acts chapter 4 and 5, when uh, falsely condemned and then ordered to be flogged and then uh, commanded not again to speak in the name of Jesus. And yet, even in those situations, you can choose not to be embittered by the uh, adversities of life. 
You can choose to see things the way Peter does, that even in those instances when it doesn't work out uh, so glowingly, so wonderfully, uh, that in fact, even in the midst of that, you are blessed. But even if you should suffer for doing what's right, Peter says in verse 14, you are blessed. For it's better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And it was Peter's own experience. After being flogged, the Bible tells us in Acts 5, the apostles, including Peter, left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the sake of the name. It's that joy, even in the midst of adversity, not just when things are going well, not just when you're you know, approaching graduation day and maybe you're in for some honors that will be bestowed on you, and all, but also when you've flunk out, when things don't work as planned, to have joy even in that situation, that's the difference of what it means to be a Christian, isn't it? Uh, Peter starts his letter in this way. He talks about how we've been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the power of Christ, that power of the resurrection released in our lives to take what looks like death and turn it into life. And because of this and because of the hope for which we await in this, you greatly rejoice, Peter says. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. But these, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. He goes on and says, though you have not seen Christ, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Sam Shoemaker, who is one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, went on record as saying something that has just always been to me such an arresting insight. Uh, he said that the surest mark of a Christian is not faith, and it's not even love. We say, wait a minute. Faith, of course, faith is a prerequisite, and Shoemaker isn't denying that. Love, of course, love is necessary. It's the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment. But the problem with those two as diagnostic of Christians, even for our own self diagnosis, is we can all fake it. We can delude ourselves into thinking we have faith when all we have is belief, and even the demons believe and tremble. We can imagine that we have love, you know, when you like. For example, speak the truth in love. Uh, but for the person on the receiving end, it sure feels like hate. Uh, but there's one attribute that you cannot counterfeit and about which you cannot even deceive yourselves. Shoemaker says, no, the surest mark of a Christian is not faith or even love, but joy. You can't counterfeit joy. You can't fool yourself into thinking you've got irrepressible and contagious joy. No, instead you look in the mirror and what you will see more often than not is this cauldron, this poisonous bile mixture of anger, resentment, frustration, dread, all churning around within us and producing grumpiness. <laughs> and also a critical spirit turned outward. But the first evidence among many of the converts in the New Testament is the irrepressible joy. In reality, if we are genuine Christians, we are like that paralytic uh, who was met by Peter at the temple gate called Beautiful. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I give have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk, taking him by the right hand. He helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. It's irrepressible. The rest of the scriptures talk about the disciples who were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Or the kingdom of God not being a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Michael Green, the great a historian of early church evangelism in his landmark study says this, joy was a characteristic thing about the early Christians which attracted others into their company. If men could, for the love of one they had never seen, 
Quote, rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Quoting 1 Peter chapter 1. Even when faced by a brutal death as human torture, torches in Emperor Nero's gardens, then it is not surprising that the Christian gospel carried conviction and so many believed. In the New Testament world, they were familiar with Stoicism. They knew all about sucking it up and enduring hardship, even without complaining. But they had never seen joy, not in the midst of sorrow and affliction and difficulty. They never saw the likes of a Peter leaving the Sanhedrin rejoicing because he had been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of the name. And so Peter exhorts us to watch our lives, to live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, love as brothers. And here we then come to at least two of the wonderful legacies of what it means to be evangelicals. Uh, You and I, you as members of the Gordon College community, I as a pastor at Park Street Church in Boston, uh, get to enjoy this wonderful emphasis that was hard won for us by the architects of the new evangelical movement starting in the late 30s and mostly the 40s and early 50s, and especially the work of Harold John Ockengay, who was a pastor at Park Street Church for 32 years and a president here at Gordon College, at least for a period of time, about six or seven years, as I recall. Ockengay, along with Carl F. H. Henry, Billy Graham, Billy Graham, who said of Ockengay that there was no other person outside his family that more influenced him other than Ockengay. Uh, Graham, and then we could add other names uh, to that list of greats, E.J. Carnell, Bernard Ram, and and even J. Howard Pugh, the president of Sunoco Oil that helped fund it all uh, in many respects and deserves real uh, appreciation from the Christian community. It's they who began to distance themselves from their early fundamentalism. Oh, they all viewed themselves as fundamentalists. But they realized that the fundamentalism as it evolved into the 30s had acquired certain lethal characteristics for them spiritually. They wanted still up to uphold the centrality and the exclusivity of the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died for them and rose again for their justification. There was no budging on the centrality of the gospel of Christ. They agreed with their fundamentalist brothers and sisters and with their own past in stressing the uh, ex- exclusive authority, the unsurpassed authority of Scripture for all matters of faith and practice and its trustworthiness because they didn't want to have any lesser view of the Bible than Jesus himself. But besides those two pillars, they differed and really repented from their own earlier fundamentalist views in three ways, and two of them had to do with love. Number one, love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Jonathan Swift, the essayist, once said, we have just enough religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love. And they recognized that so often within their fundamentalist circles, they were spending all their time being vicious, criticizing fellow believers, how things could have been done better in that church, or arguing over secondary doctrinal issues. Oh, here we have this great... Uh, common faith and hope in Christ. Instead, we're endlessly arguing about baptism that takes all of three minutes out of one's life. Uh, How much water, to whom it should be... Not that it's unimportant. These men all had very strong convictions about what was right. But their strongest conviction was it was not right to divide over these matters to divide over ecclesiology, over issues of women and church leadership, to divide over any of the things, the gifts of the Spirit that up till that point had so preoccupied them. Gay wrote, fragmentation, separation, cynicism, censoriousness, and suspicion are the order of de- the day for fundamentalism, the fundamentalism that he had known in any case. And part of his therapy then in God's leading was he started his ministry in two Methodist churches, one after another, then two Presbyterian churches, and finally in a congregational church where it's just a mishmash of everybody. Uh, Carl F. H. Henry, meanwhile, also upset about the militancy and the belligerence of the fundamentalism of his day, said Christianity to become a a search-and-destroy operation. It's like we're out to kill one another. 
Any least deviation from our convictions becomes then the target for the next lambast. He said, no, the word of God made love so much the final test of Christian integrity that even the truth of revelation is invalidated by lovelessness, just as love is falsified by untruth. We're not to be anti this or anti that, but pro-Christ. The time has come for evangelicals to lower the fences that divide them. Let us carry placards of proclamation, not billboards of condemnation. Let us dare to show the dawn rather than merely damn the darkness. It is time to ring the bells again to emphasize the joy of being a Christian, the delight and dignity of walking with God. Augustine was one of the greatest of all Christian philosophers, Carl F. H. Henry says, but that brilliant mind was first attracted to faith in Christ by the spontaneous joy of the first believers he met. In 1957, then, Billy Graham started inviting anyone, regardless of church membership, denominational affiliation, that would be a part of his evangelistic crusades, Roman Catholic or Protestant, to join with him hand in hand in these crusades and then to refer those who made decisions for Christ back to those churches. 1963, he invited on the platform a Roman Catholic bishop. In 64, in the Great Crusade here in Boston, he wrote, uh, negotiated time with uh, Cardinal Cushing uh, so that Cushing would then uh, invite Roman Catholics to participate. Uh, Graham, of course, was criticized viciously uh, for this inclusiveness. And his response was, you know, we had a collie on our farm, and... What would be a farm without plenty of cats? We had plenty of them, too. Not knowing any better, I once took a cat and shut it in the doghouse with the dog. They hated each other with some ancient instinct that when they went in, but after spending the night inside, they came out friends forever. (laughs) Maybe that is where the seeds of some of my ecumenical convictions were planted wanting to help people at odds with each other find ways to get along together. You know, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's one of the legacies of the evangelical movement. A second one is not just loving those who share our common love for Christ, but also loving those who need to hear about the love of Christ and loving them in practical ways, the social consciousness of the evangelical movement uh, to recover a very precious part of the gospel, ministering to the whole person, to the whole need of the whole person. And so the evangelicals then founded hospitals, started running schools, relief and development ministries, literacy programs, and started working on reconciliation, racial reconciliation. Harold John Ockengay, back in 1934, started to preach on race, race prejudice and segregation. In a whole series of sermons starting in 1934 and moving on right into 1942, long before the modern civil rights movement, he preached this, the race problem, quote, has been the source of hatred, murder, and innumerable cruel wars. This former president of Gordon College He said, the rise and the expansion of the white race is one of the most sordid chapters in our history. In another sermon, he said, brutality, frauds, pillage, plunder, cruelty, knavery, and human horror have followed in its trail. The white man appropriated whatever he desired. One need not be a student of history to recognize how the brown, yellow, and black peoples have been browbeaten and robbed of life and liberty by white exploitation. He lamented that racial prejudice is one of the greatest problems and sins in our country in another message. He said there's no excuse for it. No stain is darker upon our shield of justice than the treatment of blacks. And so in his introduction to Carl F. H. Henry's famous book, The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism, published in 1947, He wrote, Ockengay did, I became a political liberal on my knees, though I am a fundamentalist in faith. Why must the church be on the wrong side of every major social issue? What a prophetic statement and what a haunting question for that generation 
as well as for ours. Of course, we must practice what we preach, but we must also preach what we practice. There's a moral responsibility. If Anderson and Kelly had said nothing, many lives would have been lost that night. But because they flagged down first one car, one truck, and then another, after a while there was a whole group of people flagging down further motorists so that they didn't needlessly perish that night. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but how can they call on one of whom they've not believed? How can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can they preach unless they're sent? By the way, preaching isn't what I'm doing tonight. In the New Testament, preaching invariably is speaking to non-believers. It's never used of sermonizing to the faithful, this term. And, that, and that's why, by the way, in the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament, none of the prophets is ever said to preach except for one. Uh, seven times over, Jonah is called a preacher or one who preaches. And why is that? Well, because his ministry was to the Ninevites. Uh, preaching, though, is what we must do. That is, we must share the good news. We must share the good news for those who haven't heard it, just as others shared it with us and took courage to do so and live it in front of us to commend the faith so that we would pay attention. Why won't we love others as much as we've been loved? Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You have, of course, lots of preparation as those who are blessed to be soon to be graduates of Gordon College. Uh, this is just an aside. By the way, when people ask you someday, you know, what, what school do you go? You're going to be asked. You'll, you won't be asked too often, what do you believe in? Uh, I hope that you will be asked at least sometimes and you'll have an answer, but you will be asked hundreds of times, well, where'd you go to college? Where'd you go to school? Uh, don't just kind of wimp out at that point and say, oh, it's, you know, it's a small school in, uh, in north of Boston, because, of course, no one knows Wenham and all that. Well, that's fine. You can do the north of Boston if you want. Say you, had, you came, you, you, you went to a great college. You can't believe how excellent a school I was blessed to go to. Oh, yes, I mean, of course, every school is a collection of sinners, like every organization is a collection of sinners, but you had the blessing of actually a school that wanted to challenge you and nourish you, mind, heart, and soul, body as well. You didn't have to you know, deal with a school where they're afraid to minister to your need to grow spiritually. And you weren't uh, disadvantaged by going to a place where all the answers were jammed down your throat. You were encouraged to ask hard questions and not put up with just easy answers, as has been said. And so now you can disabuse the general public of all kinds of caricatures that they're carrying around in their heads, the stereotype that to be a, a real serious Christian, you have to be a member of a certain political party. Uh, you know way too many good examples of earnest believers uh, that uh, don't follow that rule. You don't have to be uncultured and dislike fine music or poetry or art or be suspicious of modern art to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ because you've watched it be exemplified in your art department and literature, English departments. and so You don't have to be apathetic about the environment to be an evangelical like so many assume must be the case. You don't have to be mean-spirited or narrow-minded. You don't have to be anti-intellectual or afraid of science and disrespectful of science. One of the great ministries and blessings I had from one of your alumni uh, was something that took place when I was in college. I was a physics major at Harvard, and we were blessed one day to have Meredith Klein come down to our campus fellowship and share with us his understanding of the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2. I'm not going to reproduce all of his arguments, but I will tell you this. In that Christian fellowship were many who were in the sciences, one form or another. We were dying in that environment, even as we've heard, I guess, Ashley share about Northeastern. The same kinds of issues were being raised back then. And suddenly here was this amazing scholar. Turned out that he got into Harvard, but he decided to go to a better college. He went to Gordon. 
And he graduated and went on and pursued his doctorate in Hebrew studies and all the rest of it. But a man of tremendous culture. He was a, an accomplished artist. He was a musician, played the violin very effectively. Uh, he loved sport. He uh, canoed and took, uh, went running frequently. You'd see him around South Hamilton and so on. He loved science, but especially he loved the interpretation of God's word. And he pointed out... I, I don't remember all the arguments now, but as he shared them, I did cling on to a few uh, that maybe these days weren't necessarily earthly, literal days since the sun wasn't created until the fourth day. And after all, the seventh day, according to Hebrews chapter 4 and John chapter 5, that's still going on now. So that's not a literal earthy, earthly day. Maybe these are days in heaven uh, that somehow or other heavenly time is mapped out as just one long week. And all of creation then is explained in terms of God's frame of reference, uh, where chronology doesn't necessarily even map into our experience chronologically. After all, from heavenly perspective, Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, and in our time, only 2,000 years ago. In any case, it was like a breath of fresh air for us. In fact, it was more than that. It was like CPR to someone in intensive care, uh, dying uh, right there on the bed. And our hearts were revived, and we wanted to drink from the same wells that that great man of God was drinking from. What's the hope that you have? Well, it's a hope that's grounded in the resurrection. Yes, it's a hope that transforms our life with the same power of the resurrection released in it. It's a hope that secures for us an eternal destiny. Let me tell you about, and with this I'll close, Dr. Ockengay's own hope. He was dying of cancer. He called for the elders of Park Street Church to come and pray for him and anoint him with oil because he believed in James 5. It was, in fact, however, the last week of his life. He was now down to just a skeleton of 85 pounds in his home here in South Hamilton. Um, a former youth pastor of mine was attending to him, and Mrs. Ockengay said, well, the elders are coming. Would you mind putting on a Dr. Ockengay's suit? Uh, even though he was confined to the bed, he had a three-piece suit on and a tie, and uh, it just seemed to go with his dignity. The elders of the church came and saw the figure of this man in bed, knowing that he was approaching his death so weak he could hardly speak. And I guess it threw him off when they saw him him in his suit. <laughs> and so they all of a sudden became all oh, this deferential, you know, they, one of them said, oh, think of it, Harold, uh, Dr. Ockengay, of course, actually, as they called him, uh, Dr. Ockengay, uh, it's not going to be too long before you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And, uh, you know, you, after all, you pastored Park Street Church for 32 years, and think of all the lives you've touched. And then another added in, yes, and you were president of Gordon College, and you were a president at Fuller Theological Seminary before that, and Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary after that. And you gave Billy Graham his start. And think of all the implications of that. You started the National Association of Evangelicals. You helped found Christianity Today, and on and on. And each of them were chiming in. And at last, the youngest of the elders, David McCain, last to speak, said, Well, Harold, I suggest that when you see the Master, you just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And at that point, up until then, Ockengay had been unmoved by all this adulation. He didn't even make a sound. It didn't seem to give him any comfort. But at that suggestion, tears began to roll down his cheeks, where the deep comfort of the hope that is Christ who is in us took a hold of his soul, and he went with joy to meet his maker. May it be so for all of us.